Reformed Church. How's everyone today? Beautiful day. Well, this morning we're going to talk about crucibles, struggling with all energy with the Holy Spirit in us. And I'm just going to have us bow our heads and have a brief word of prayer. Lord God, King of the universe, fill us now with your Holy Spirit and help us to live above this world. We renew our vow to you. We give you permission to take out everything you want to take out. Help us to live above sin. Thank you for the Sabbath day. Thank you for life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this Sabbath school lesson, I think, uh, oops, we're not showing on the screen. <laughs> there we go. I'll just test this for one sec. There we go. Um, when I saw the title and I saw uh, what we will be discussing and I saw the word crucible, I thought, well, this is perfect for me, not just because I have crucibles, and I have gone through many in my life. Um, but I'm a chemist. I'm actually a chemist, so I work with crucibles. <laughs> so uh, one thing that we use uh, crucibles for, oh, it's not showing, sorry. Yeah. There we go, thanks. So one thing that we use crucibles for in a lab, especially a research lab looking for new things, uh, is to identify unknowns. It's not... Uh, so much used today in purification, but more to help you find out what's really there. You know, uh, so if you have some sort of unknown, like an unknown sample, you put it in a crucible and you can tell uh, what sorts of compounds are in there. That'll become more clear in the next slide. But what I want you to reflect on today, and by the way, please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question or if you want to read a Bible scripture, and I'll pass you one of the mics over here. Um, so interrupt at any time, just raise your hand. So one thing I'd like you to think about is what types of unknowns do you think the Holy Spirit may need to pull out of us? And here's the other thing, why might there be a need for crucibles? It's not God's uh, method of choice. If you look at Lamentations 3.33, uh, in fact, that might be a good one to have someone read. Uh, could someone read Lamentations 3.33? You'll see that it's not really, it's not God's plan. It's not God's plan to have pain come into our life. It's not part of God's plan to have pain. But just because crucibles uh, isn't, you know, God's, something God chooses, it doesn't mean that it's not something he can use. Uh, does someone have Lamentations 3.33? If you can read it out loud. Someone want to read that? Lamentations 3, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So he does not afflict willingly. So, let me ask you a question. What purpose, well, let me backtrack. What kind of God do we serve? We ser serve a God of love, right? God, he's not only a God of love, but he's a God of purpose. So what kind of purpose could a crucible have? What kind of, cru like, what kind of purpose could it have? What is an example of a crucible, let's say, in your life? Well, something, for example, could this be a crucible? If you have an illness or a car accident, right? Or uh, something bad happens to you. Can you learn from such an event as a Christian? What do you think? Yes, of course. And in fact, one of the, the ways we learn, I mean, we can learn, you know, when it's a beautiful sunny day like today, the birds are chirping, everything is great. We know God loves us, but it's really <laughs> a lot of the lessons we learn in life happen when, you know, things don't work out the way we expect, right? And God can do that. 
But here's the main point. God works with our free will. God works with our free will. He can't force you to change. So sometimes he will allow something to happen so that you realize what needs to change in yourself. In other words, you learn what the unknowns are in your character. Does, does that make sense? So that's actually an example of what we use crucibles for in the lab. Sometimes we take a very, very small sample of an unknown. And I don't know if you could see the writing at the very bottom there. When it burns uh, green, for example, uh, we have copper. If it's orange, it's calcium. Uh, we can also see sodium, potassium. There are many, many other compounds and things we can see. But that gives you a little example. It shows you what's in the sample. And uh, these unknowns in your character need to come out because God has to work with your free will. He can't force you to change. He can't force you to repent. So God can use these crucibles to help identify things that need to change in your life. Does that make sense? So I know it's hard to, to think about, but when bad things happen, like Paul, it's our attitude that matters. It's our attitude that matters. You can look at what's happening as a burden, and then you can, you know, you'll always be tripped up in that. Or you can look at it as a bridge to get closer to God and to be able to change your character for the good. Now, you can't change it alone, but we, you can allow the Holy Spirit in your life to do that. Does someone want to make a comment about that story on the, on, uh, uh, it was, it's on Lesson 6, of course, the Sabbath afternoon uh, story there was a very interesting story uh, about two people who went through a terrible crucible and what was the person who actually survived it in sort of a positive way what happened what did they do what was the secret to let's say success in going through that terrible crucible if you lose a child or a, a loved one, that's a terrible, terrible thing, especially if it's an act of violence, right? Uh, I mean, not just losing them in illness, but if someone did something terrible and they died. It's a, it's a horrible thing to go through. That I would call a crucible. And so one person was able to what? What's the key word there? Forgive. 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 Not an easy thing to do. And you have to pray for that power to be able to do that. We cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. The person who did not forgive, you know, that, that torment, the hate, the anger is self-destructive. It's, it's self-destructive. It's always good for us to remember this. I'm going to say it. The same God who has the power to forgive sin is the same God who can fill you with His Holy Spirit and help you live above sin. He is the same God who can write His character in your mind. But here's the key. It's free will. You have to allow Him. We can do this. Everyone here uh, in earshot of hearing me this morning can make a decision to allow God into their life. Be baptized in Christ. Allow the Holy Spirit in your life. And allow Him to take out things that need to be taken out. Including lack of forgiveness, hate. All the things which go against the Spirit of God. Now, one thing I have seen, I, I was a young man and now I'm old. <laughs> or older, I guess. It's relative. Um, hate, anger... You know, breaking the commandments of God lead to pain, lead to death, lead to disease. And I'll show you a slide, actually, I'm a research chemist, and we have found that actually stress leads to disease. And sin creates stress. Sin 
creates death. <laughs> you know? So we have to be very, very careful on our attitude to allow God into our heart. Anyone want to make a comment about that? Like the, the, uh, that first lesson? Or, I mean, the, the Sabbath afternoon? I'm just going to move because it's, of course, linked to Sunday. The title of Sunday is The Spirit of Truth. And the question that we ask, or that, sorry, the Holy Spirit will ask us is, you know, when you go through a crucible, you will learn something about yourself. You'll see, right? And, and you know, it's your, let's say, it's your right. God wants you to ask Him what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to learn from this? It's a kind of emotional learning, right? So the Holy Spirit is going to ask you, okay, I've shown you this. You have free will, right? What will you do? And one thing I've learned, like I said, I was young and now I'm old, is that God's way is the best way. It really is. It's a way to peace. And allow, you know, if... We don't need to fight. You allow God to deal with evil. Okay, he has that power. He has that power. Um, one thing I wanted to mention here. Why do you think Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth? Why would he be called the Spirit of truth? Anyone? What, what truth what, tr what, what is the truth he's talking about? Is it the word of God? That's one. Uh, is it the truth about who you are? Right? It's personal. It's personal. He's going to show you who you are. By his grace, he covers you. And the same God, like I said, who has the power to forgive you and cover you by his grace is the same God who can help you live above sin. And if you look at his character, God does not change. God is loving. God has purpose in your life. So for a child of God, crucibles have purpose. It's a good purpose because he is a good God. He's a loving God. <clears throat> I'm just going to switch to the next one. Oops, I'm pointing in the wrong direction. So this is not just about, um, you know, whether or not the Spirit has power uh, to change us. He has infinite power. But he works with and respects our free will. That's the key, right? God has the power to do anything he wants. There's nothing too hard for him to do. But you have to make the choice. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ah, that's a good question. I'll repeat it. So we know we have the Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit is there. How do we handle doubt? What happens? And that's a crucible. I would call that a crucible, right? Because different things can happen and you say, oh Lord, why did this happen to me? Or why did this happen to my child? Or why did this happen to that person? How do we deal with that? Well, one thing I can say, I'll just share my thoughts on that. And that's a, a, a very important question. That's, that's like where the rubber meets the road uh, type of question. In my own life, I... I have prayed about it, and we, ask, we can ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. And one thing I have seen is this, that um, we don't see the full picture. We don't see the full picture, right? Like, wh when we see things happening either in our life, or we see things happening on the news, or we see, ter you know, something terrible happen, for example, um, we have to know that God is in charge. And one uh, way I have learned is to trust Him. Again, I repeat this. What kind of God do we serve? He's a loving God, right? He does not want pain. And He has 
in Romans it says, has condemned sin already at the cross. And it says in Romans also, that there is now, not tomorrow, now no condemnation in you. Leave God to do the things of God. He will bring out justice. That's a promise. Now how do we deal with it personally? It's hard. It's not easy. And that's why we struggle with all energy. It's not easy. We daily, and you know, I think God did this because he wants us to know him. Daily, we have to ask for that. Every day I say, Lord, take out anything you want to take out. Bring in anything you want to bring in. You, I give you permission. I give you permission. That's how I deal with it. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to share uh, their thoughts or little, you know, spiritual insights? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Th that's why I wrote that. <laughs> we have to forgive ourselves. God has forgiven you. And, you know, and other people might point the finger and, and find out, of course, they have a, some people have a photographic memory when it comes to your mistakes. <laughs> a photographic memory. They can list them. But they maybe can't even remember their bank account number, but they can remember all your mistakes. But you need to leave it to God. You're right. And absolutely right. So the key thing is to trust Him, leave it to Him, he, and forgive yourself, because who are we, not even us, <laughs> to say that God has not forgiven? He has. Sometimes we deal with the remnant of things, but that God will make a new heaven and a new earth. We need to just put it all in his hands. Remember, God loves you. God loves you, okay? That's what it's all about. To, for us to love each other the way he loves us, and for us to love him as he loves us. It's all about love. Mercy. Mercy above sacrifice. Mercy. This is the type of God we serve. So when ba bad things happen, when doubts happen, remember who God is. He's a God of love. He loves you. Okay? Don't forget that. And that's... Uh, I'm glad you raised that. I was almost... Uh, forgetting to put that, but forgiveness. Now, I put that little uh, note there, Johns Hopkins 2022. You don't, uh, don't Google it now, but uh, you can always find it um, on, uh, you know, in the, actually it's in the literature, it's, uh, the NIH has this, but there was a, I thought this was a very interesting article, uh, since we're in chemistry a bit, uh, forgiveness, your health depends on it, is the title of the article. It just came out of Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine. Uh, basically, it's going to touch on something I'm going to talk about in, in a slide or two. But forgiveness, the act to, to, you know, to be able to let go, right? Leave it in God's hands. Actually has real, real benefit to your body. They have found uh, the act of forgiveness. People who forgive, people who are merciful, people who are empathetic have less illness. And I'm talking about the immune system. I'm talking about cancer because cancer is linked to the immune system. I'm going to use a word called epigenetics. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, but literally every organ in your body, your health, is better when you do that. God made us, it's, and here's the funny thing, that article was, uh, the research was done by people who are not in a Christian university. They, are not, they were not uh, in a Christian university, and yet they found, and one of the comments uh, that a researcher said was that it's almost as if we were hardwired for love. Your body was not hardwired for hate. And hate just hurts yourself. If you harbor hate, 
and lack of forgiveness, you're not hurting the other person. You're bringing up your blood pressure. You're hurting your immune system. You're, hurt, you're hurting your brain. <laughs> you understand? So, yeah. So, the other thing I wanted to point out here, too, is forgiveness, as in all, and this is an example of, uh, you know, how we deal with sin. Forgiveness is an actual act. You're not just sitting down in your chair and doing nothing. Like, you're not sitting there and letting the Holy Spirit come in. It's not just words. It's not just words. It's an act of forgiving and letting go, even if the person does not deserve to be <laughs> forgiven. Do you understand? Because so, we don't. We, we have, we, we, our sins, Jesus took care of at the cross. We are guilty too. Okay? So, it's, uh, forgiveness and overcoming is an act. It's not just sitting down and letting the Holy Spirit do something alone. You're, you're working with Him. Any, any comment or question? I'll just move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so in a sense, when we allow the Holy Spirit in our life, this is when we uh, allow ourselves to be born again in Christ. So when you make an active decision to be baptized, you are in Christ. If you, you know, believe the word and you're actually giving yourself to God. So the act of being born again the act of allowing Christ in your life, you in Christ and he in you, as he is in the Father, allows him to send his Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus says it, said it was imperative that I leave, so I send you the helper. Right? So being born again of the Spirit means a very, very intimate relationship. Intimate relationship with God himself. Your body is the temple. And this is why we become a new community based on love. And it's kind of interesting because it's the first time in history that a community now is based on love, not geography, not language, not genetics, not uh, you know, social structures, right? It's based on love based on the Holy Spirit. So we are a new community, a new people, a strange people. But soon, we will be everywhere, <laughs> one day. So it's, uh, the other thing too is this, not to be discouraged and how we are to struggle with all energy is to know that it's, it's not, you know, a decision done one day and then you just leave it aside. It's every day. God wants to be with you. The king of the universe wants to live in your heart every day. But he doesn't force himself. He, he allows you to make that decision. And that's what makes it beautiful, right? Um, so we become, we become a living sacrifice. I find that a very interesting choice of words. Living sacrifice. Sacrifice makes you think about death. Right? Death. Sacrifice. Death. Living sacrifice. It's almost a contradiction. God calls you to carry a cross. Right? And what do you carry a cross for? It's a crucible to death but you're living. <laughs> so what, what did God do? What did Jesus do after the cross? He resurrects. God resurrects. So God is not calling us to die and just leave it there. He's calling us to die to sin and to be resurrected in the Spirit. Be born again. We're not dead <laughs> and stay dead. We're being born again by the Spirit daily in a daily um, walk. Any questions, thoughts? <clears throat> like my wife says, I do all the talking sometimes. So, so please feel free. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. She says, uh, growing up, we have to submit every morning, right? We yeah. have to give ourselves into God's hands. Yes. Um, 
I found making a personal choice every morning to give all my plans yep. to him, right? And it works, right? Yep. And I have to ask him the power to submit, yep. and he gives me that power. And he also, he cleanses my will and he strengthens me, right? Yes. And I ask him to search me and he looks and he shows me the things I need to do yep. and where to find the scriptures. And I find great comfort and he always takes care of me, right? Absolutely. I find it easier when I submit rather than try to fight against it, right? Yep. Now I got to remember all the things I inherited, the things right. that I cultivated through and I grew up in all the lies that are in there. Yep. And he looks and he shows me and little by little, little by little, Yep. And now I'm learning to bring all my thoughts under control. Right. Right. And certain sins that had the power over me, mm -hmm. he's given me the power over them again. Yep. And I gave them to him, and I yes. want to be free. And now I am free, truly yes. free. Right? Yep. And I'm very happy now. God bless you. And you know what? You're not alone. Each person here, each person on YouTube or li live streaming us, we're all the same. We're all in that same boat. And I think that's the beautiful thing, too. I would have loved if, you know, when I made a decision, I, I became baptized, I, was, I grew up Catholic, uh, and I became baptized when I was 17. Uh, I would have loved it if once and for all, at that time, and then I never sinned again, and, you know, everything was great. But, you know what? Uh, I'll say it. There's something beautiful about allowing, God allowing free will, something beautiful about making a decision daily, like you said, because you get to know God that way. It's an intimate relationship. It's like for those of you who are married, you know, you don't just, you know, get married and then that's it and you don't talk anymore, right? You need to talk to each other. You need, and talking means not just giving God a list of things like a genie in a bottle and say, you know, I need this, 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 this today, thanks, and then walk away. No, you talk. That means you listen. You listen to. Uh, I'm going to just rush through this a little bit. Uh, so the next part is the divine human combination. And this is actually coming down to your point of daily. You know, it's, it's don't get the, uh, don't fall into the trap of thinking that I'm a Superman and, you know, I'm going to be in. No, it's not you. It's God. And you, we were not meant to live above sin on our own power. We were meant to be a temple for the Holy Spirit. That, that God can work through your free will. Through your free, that's key, free will. To transform you so that in the end you will have his character. You can live above sin. You can be transformed. And, you know, uh, and I won't name other churches, but I think our denomination has it right on so many levels with grace. Yes, we are saved by grace. But the whole point is, you know, <laughs> grace is to help you live above sin. What is sin? Well, transgression of the law. Uh, overcoming those things, right? The law is good. It's loving. It's, there's nothing to be done away with there in terms of, you know, daily being able to live above sin. Not to try and be saved by your power over the law. You were saved by grace. But the Holy Spirit wants to, the end result, the point of grace is to have a creature who by free will, free will, chooses to live with the law of love, the law of liberty. So, it's our decision, you know, that God is infinite. He can do anything. But our free will can limit, our decisions can limit. But you can still pray. And if you've made, like myself, mistakes in the past, I have made plenty, <laughs> you know. God can not only forgive, but give you the power to live above sin. He can. The same God has that power. Just let him into your life. Take that chance. Allow him. That's all. Any other questions on that? And I just put that on the side. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. You know, um, of course, that means uh, that it's, although it's not explicitly stated there, forgiveness, right? Forgiveness, 
uh, mercy, love, empathy, all those things go together. Uh, so don't harbor hate. Just let it go. Allow God's Spirit to go in you. These are the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And don't get discouraged if you're lacking in one or two. I, I remember, not, not the pastor for our church, but a pastor in the States was saying, uh, he was saying a funny story. Uh, I won't mention his name, but he's in the States. Very nice man, and he can sing. Uh, and he's saying, you know, one thing, uh, I'm driving, and I just want that guy to go faster. <laughs> right? Uh, so, yeah, you know, we have these little things, impatience and so on. Just work with God. God can do it, right? God can do it. Actually, that speeding thing is an interesting thing because he brought out a point. I'll just stick it in here too. If you do speed and you're caught by a police officer, right, what are you going to plead? Are you going to say justice or are you going to say mercy? Think about it, <laughs> right? You're not... Justice means you're going to have to pay that ticket, right? Mercy means, okay, I'll let you go, all right? That's what God has done for us. That's what we want to do for others. God's character is love. He never changes, and he wants us to be that way. He wants us to get to that point where we will keep Torah out of love by his spirit and never change character like him. We can reflect him. He can do it. Just trust him and let him, to, uh, let him work in your life. Oops. There we go. Um, I put that quote. Again, this is divine human combination. Uh, I, and I needed to say this here. Jesus is our perfect example of God in the flesh, divine human combination. That's the goal, Right? that he wants to see his character in you. So Jesus is our perfect example. He is God in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit can transform you. He can transform you. And notice that uh, the Holy Spirit is looked upon as the spirit of freedom. So I've done a lot of talking for right now. I want to ask you this question. Freedom, what does that mean? Uh, Satan accused, you know, before some, some uh, there was an interesting Seventh-day Adventist um, conference, and one point that, was, uh, that came out of it was very interesting. This is the first time I ever heard this, that in a sense, Satan captivated and trapped the law before Adam and Eve. He said, God told you you can't eat from that tree? Almost saying, look, you know, that, that commandment's unfair, right? The Holy Spirit is a God of freedom. So are the commandments of God a law of liberty or are they restrictive? Are we not in this crucible called earth learning the hard lesson that sin is death, right? And, and so we need to see that the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom of life. In fact, again, like the slide before, why it takes long is He works with our free will. We are free in Him. But the enemy, not so. He will trap you and try and keep you and not let you go. But God is God, and God can let you go. God can save you. But the Holy Spirit is not restrictive. He respects your free will. So it's actually an act of faith that we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us. Anyone have a comment on that? Uh, so that. Now, this brings us to uh, disciplining our will. I'm, I'm just going to put this uh, quote from Ellen White that uh, caught my eye. I'll give you a second to read that. Um, it's our freedom to allow the Holy Spirit to show us the ugliness of sin. And that's one good prayer to pray. Let, let ask God to show you the ugliness of sin that we may cherish so that you get repelled by it. 
You know, let, let him show you that so that by free will, you can say, oh my goodness, I don't want to do that. Right? So allow God's spirit to take away, uh, you know, some pet sin, some habit, something in your life to allow the power of the spirit. It's about love, mercy above sacrifice. God will work with you as long as you allow him. In, and here's the beauty of it. In freedom, in freedom, you're free. It's your free choice to allow the Holy Spirit. And eventually, we will, by grace, by the covering grace of Christ, keep the law of love by, because we love, <laughs> because the Holy Spirit has transformed us. Not, you know, that, not that imagine, you know, just imagine the scary thought for a moment. Imagine if we had to gain our own salvation, how scary that would be. You know, what a burden that would be. One of the, um, I think, symbols of rest of the Sabbath is to realize that Christ has saved us by grace, that that work has been done by him. And then now the transforming power needs to come in. But there, that's a beautiful rest that he gives. But I thought that this quote was amazing because, you know, it's a process where God works with your free will toward sanctification. But the beautiful good news this morning is you can eventually live above sin. So the disciplined will. I just put this quote um, because it caught my eye. Notice, what does it say? The fruit of the tree looked pleasing to the eye. It looked nice. The, the, God could have made the tree you know, with a thundercloud over it and smelling bad or something. Uh, but he allowed it to look good, right? He wasn't trying to trap us, right? But notice the, 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 uh, the tree itself and the, the fruit of it look good. And the lie was that it's a restriction. You're not free. You can't eat from that tree. There's like a million, probably a million other fruit trees around that you could eat out of. But it looked good it, to the eye. It was desirable. Maybe it even tasted good. I don't know. But it was also said that it would, uh, you would gain wisdom from it. Right? So what, what message can you get out of there? What, what kind of crucibles have that, that kind of look? They may not look ugly. They might not smell ugly or taste ugly. They may look enticing, but you've got to see and allow the Holy Spirit to say, is that the really the best route or not? Sometimes the traps of the world, we're bombarded every day, right? About what do you feel like eating? What do you want to, what do you feel like? What, we're doing everything by feeling, by emotion, right? Not by prayer. And that, that's a discipline. That's a struggle. Right? We need to get into the habit of doing things not by emotions and feelings, but by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit. Right? Any other uh, thoughts on that? Anyone want to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, it's true. We're, our, it's a human tendency to want more and more and more and more and not give, but take, right? And um, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, it's like our, uh, let's say, lust of the eyes, uh, you know, lust of the flesh, lust, you know, the pride of life, the power that we want is never satisfied. We're always looking, looking, looking. What do we have? All those things, like Paul said, all those things, Paul said, I account as rubbish, as nonsense. You have infinite, the infinite indwelling of the Holy Spirit when you are in Christ, when you're baptized. That's why it's so important to make the decision if you're, if you're listening here or on YouTube or wherever you are, make the decision to be baptized in Christ. Give Him a chance 
to show you who he is. That's true freedom. Yeah, go ahead. All of us has desire. Yeah. He said, "Search me, O Lord. Yeah. Seek my heart." You know, every yeah. day as we get bombarded with our feeling, yeah. Yeah. we need to invite God every moment. Say, Lord, yeah. I make a decision. This, you know, am I feeling like this? Search me, Lord. If I'm, yeah. if I make the right decision, you know, if the King David, who has wise, yeah. say the same thing <laughs> every day. Yeah. Who we are, we are, True. we are even live in the worst, even the worst time. Yeah. So. God never come to our heart and open your door. Yes. It has to be the free will that yeah. we said, Lord, here yeah. it is. Search me. And then God come. Absolutely. If God wants to, to, to push your, your heart and open it, he already do that when Adam and Eve. Yes. He's going to say, oh, here, you don't, don't do this right. in here. So That's free will, it's come from our first. That's right. And you know what? Uh, and a lot of people think that, you know, it's restrictive. But it's not. God knows what's best for you. Amen. You know, I'm going to uh, use an analogy. Maybe it's, it's a bad analogy to use here. But, uh, you know, if you have a, a car, right, you're not going to put uh, a bad motor oil in your car because you know it's going to ruin it. You may not know that because you're not, maybe not an expert, right? But God knows how he made your body. He knows what's best for you. We were meant, like you said, daily to make that decision. And the beautiful thing is, it's sad to say this, you know, but it's sad because God loves us, but that forces us into a closer communion with Him, an intimate relationship with God. If you have to call upon Him daily, you see, you make yourself available. It's like if you're married, you talk to your wife daily. You don't talk to her once a month or, you know, once 10 years ago. You talk to her daily. Communication is important, like I said before. So, it's, you're right. Take out anything you want to take out from my life. Bring in what you want to bring in. And, you know, I'll say this too about crucibles. It's easy to, you know, uh, to see love and peace when everything is going well. But you really, really see God's love and power when mistakes happen. Uh, you know, we chose wrong, we get into a mess, and God catches us, right? That's where we learn. Um, and you're right, we're daily faced with these problems, and we have to make a daily decision. Uh, I'll say radical commitment here, uh, looking at Wednesday's lesson, radical commitment. How is gold refined? Uh, you know, this is, you know, the old method for the crucible was to refine, you know, in these crucibles and modern chemistry does it in I'm a chemist by the way I came in late uh, I uh, so we use it to identify unknowns so unknowns in character and so on but gold is refined through this burning process where you know the the uh, the refiner the alchemist in the old days would see his own reflection let's say or her own reflection in in the purified gold you can see so Jesus wants to see his reflection of his character in you. Job said, he knows the way I take, and when he has tested me, I come forth as gold. Well, what did Job do? Job made a, uh, a commitment with his eyes, with his senses, right, that I would not sin. We have to make that, allow the Holy Spirit. So that's why it's divine human combination. You may have you know, uh, alone, you know, the desire, like Paul said, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, right? You may have the desire on your own to say, I don't want to do that, but then you fall, right? But with the Holy Spirit, it is actually possible to live above it and change. So overcoming emotions, we are bombarded by TV, music, advertising, uh, overcoming deeply ingrained habits, uh, Matthew 5.29, I don't know if we have time, if someone could quickly just uh, read that. Um, deeply ingrained habits have a way, and uh, actually as a, a research chemist, I'll, I'll use a word, I'm going to talk about it after, uh, epigenetics. We, um, we can get into good habits, or we can get into bad habits. 
And um, I'll, I'll talk about it. I think it's in the next slide. Uh, literally, our DNA, our DNA, the surface of our DNA, the shape of our DNA changes depending on the lifestyle you choose. It literally, uh, genes are turned off and on depending on your lifestyle. Uh, are there any educators out here uh, in the audience? Professional teachers? Ah, then you know, have you heard of something called emotional learning? Emotional learning? Well, a crucible could be thought of as an emotional learning, right? Trauma. Uh, in fact, uh, these things have ways of affecting your DNA. Deeply ingrained habits. Like I said, good and bad. Prayer, forgiveness, love, exercising these things are definitely good for your health. Uh, that could be a lecture for another time, maybe <laughs> uh, outside of Sabbath school. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, if I may add one thing here. Uh -huh. um, it take away the control of the mind. The yes. question is, who is controlling your mind? Right. If you take away the control of your mind and leave it just empty, what will control us? Right. We will be controlled by any feelings right. that blow our way. Right. Any feelings. Right. So we have to be careful yep. to have our mind controlled yes. by God or by the Holy Spirit. Yep. You're right, absolutely right. I'll use an analogy there. If you are controlled by your emotions, the enemy is going to know that. And you could be rolled around like a bowling ball wherever he wants. Because he he'll know, oh yeah, I'll make this, you know, try and make this, and then you're going to get mad and do something, or do whatever, right? So controlling your mind, yes, and you'll be predictable, right? Allow the Holy Spirit Divine human combination. Impossible in your own power. But po everything is possible with God. And we can live a sinless life with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in free will. That's the beauty of it. Uh, I put gold is refined through the discipline of struggle uh, against, you know, and we're bombarded not just by advertising, culture, politics, society. Society. I put epigenetic factors. One day after church, or you know, if, if the pastor likes, we can do, well, uh, I don't know, like after hours or uh, prayer meeting. Epigenetics is something that I think every Christian should know about uh, because it shows how our words, how trauma, how things... Uh, I'll tell you an example. Uh, they showed pictures of bullying to students and they resemble trauma as if they were bullied themselves. Imagine with all the, the violence we see on TV, movies, and video games, what that's doing to the mind. It's actually changing the DNA. In terms of changing the shape of the DNA, shape of the DNA expression, epigenetics has been linked also with disease, cancers, dementias, and so on. It, it shows, it's very interesting epigenetics too, because it shows how sophisticated God made us. It's a beautiful argument, argument for creation against evolution. It's beautiful because it shows a sophistication in molecular machinery that God made us that it's impossible to look at that and say that there is no designer. It really is. It's like finding a wristwatch on the moon and saying that was an accident. It's impossible. But uh, epigenetics too, uh, can your decisions... Your bad decisions, we've, we've seen in the illness, in stress. In, uh, in fact, in uh, 2017, I did some work with First Nations on residential school trauma. And we were able to see the same markers that you do in Holocaust survivors two, three, four generations later. So the decisions and the things that we do affect not just yourself, but your future. Look at Jacob. We're going to see Jacob on, on, in the lesson on Friday. How did it end? He deceived, but then he put his whole family in peril because he thought Esau was coming you know, to destroy. He separated his camp. So uh, these things, God, we have to remember God's power and his love. Uh, whoops, that didn't change. There we go. 
So uh, there is this verse that I want to see and, and look at here. Uh, and I want us to, to come to this attitude. This is the attitude I want us to have. That don't be afraid of these crucibles. When crucibles happen, don't be afraid. Say, Lord, first call upon him right away. And say, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you need me to learn from this? God will give you. Ask for wisdom. God will give you wisdom. He will show you. The second thing, it's an attitude. It goes against the world. But it's an attitude. Don't be afraid of the crucibles. Embrace it. Face it like Paul. Like Paul did. Bring it on. Do it. Do whatever you have to do. Not only take out from my life what you need to take out, bring in whatever. Trust him. Okay? It's better to learn the easy way. Lamentations 3.33. God doesn't want to create, you know, allow pain. It's not something he chooses. Lamentations 3.33. It's not something he chooses. But it doesn't mean it's not something he can use. So if that's the case, that's the case. Better to be saved, right? Jesus said, pluck out, <laughs> right? We're not plucking out a physical eye, but what we're doing is plucking out sin. We're plucking out sin. Uh, we also glory, glory in tribulations. Embrace them, knowing that tribu tribulations will ultimately change your character for the good. The refiner looks into the gold being purified and knows when it's pure because they could see their own reflection perfectly. Jesus will see his character in you. Here's the kicker. By your free will. He didn't force it on you. It's by your free will. <clears throat> oh, any questions on that? Oops. Oh, no. Did I press the wrong button here? Uh, there we go. Uh, were there any questions or comments? Please feel free to interrupt. So Jacob went through a great crisis. He persevered. And I'm going to say this, gold is refined through communion with God. Like you were saying, uh, daily communion, first thing in the morning. Ask God to take your thoughts, take your desires. Take, I give you, you gave yourself for me, I give you. Be his living sacrifice. So, again, I say our Adventist denomination has a nice perspective on the living soul. Other denominations will look at the soul as having a hovering, you know, little entity separate from the body. But you are connected. Even neuroscience and, you know, chemistry shows our body is connected, right? Um... Our epigenetics shows that, too. So, our, uh, you know, the, the way of looking at this is that, uh, you know, we were not meant to live without the Holy Spirit. That's the beauty of it. Imagine the king of the universe, where the heavens are too, they're, they're too small to contain him, can live in your heart. Just think about that. Allow him. Jacob, you know, I won't press this point too long, but Jacob went, obviously, if you have a dislocated hip, that's going to hurt, <laughs> right? Through excruciating pain, right? He hung on. Jesus could have won that fight easily, right? Right? But he wanted, Jesus wanted to show him what he needed, what he needed. He hung on, all right? So that's, we are all Jacob, we are, God will change us, change our name, change our spirit. So we have recognized that. And uh, we need to, oh, and by the way, if you look at it, uh, you can read Genesis 32. The whole chapter is nice to read. Notice his prayer. He, he number one, says, I am unworthy. Who am I? Right? He, he noticed that he's unworthy. And the second thing, he claimed the promise of God. Learn the promises of God and claim them in your life. It's a good Bible exercise. And this is my last slide. I wanted to put it up. And if you have any last comments, this is what I wanted to say. Um, it's easy to see God's love, of course, when everything is going well. When the weather is good, 
your bank account is full, your, your health is great, you've got a great job, right? Everything is, everyone obeys the driving rules, no one cuts you off, everything is great. But we really learn, I think, in my opinion, we really learn when, you know, the bottom falls out and you call upon God and he's there and he catches you. That's when you really see how good God is. You know? You see and learn in your own life. Right? So whatever your crucible is, and you will face crucibles. Whatever it is. Whether, you might be deserted by family and friends. You might think you're alone. Whatever your crucible is, call upon God. He loves you. And he will not desert you. And he will help you. Allow the Holy Spirit in you. And whatever the problem is, he, I promise you that he will help you. God bless you all. And uh, I'll close with a little prayer too. Lord Jesus, thank you for life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. All, all of us right now, this time, we give you permission, my God. Take out from our life, our heart, what you want to take out. And fill us with the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Your will be done, my God. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys, love you, and enjoy your Sabbath. Larry is a cheerful person. His smile and hospitality help him make friends and mingle with people. God called him to serve as a global mission pioneer in Buolo Village in Manado, Indonesia. This district is considered an unentered area for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and many people are hungry for the gospel. Larry received approval from government officials and the village leaders to work here. The first thing he did was visit every family in the community to become friends with them. As with many other small islands, most people here work as fishermen. Larry loves to be out on the water with the fishermen, helping them feed their families. He has found that by implementing Christ's method of ministry, people allow him into their daily lives. Planting fruits and vegetables is not common practice in this area. Larry saw this as an opportunity to meet people's needs. He created a farmer's group to teach the community how to start small gardens or farms around their houses. The goal was to provide some of their vegetables, chilies, and other daily foods. Larry always starts the program. He also helps the community by distributing used clothes to them, which makes them very happy. Since this island is so remote and far from the main island, Medical care is hard to access. Malaria is a threat here. High blood pressure and cholesterol are some of the common health challenges. Larry helps out by providing free health checkups and basic medical treatment to community members. People are so grateful for what he is doing for them. One day, one of the farmer's group members was sick. He's one of the members who came regularly to the worship discussions and grew interested in the Sabbath. Larry took care of him until he was fully recovered. The family praised the Lord because of his kindness. This family has asked Larry to continue visiting them to pray and share more about the truth, especially more about the Sabbath. Please pray for the work that Larry is doing in this newly entered area of Indonesia. Pray that more people will open their hearts and be ready for the second coming of Jesus. Thank you for supporting global mission efforts to send pioneers like Larry into unentered areas of the world. A major challenge in mission is finding ways to reach the millions of people in cities around the world. The list of cities with a population of one million or more residents continues to grow. In response to this challenge, a number of churches in different cities have opened up urban centers of influence. 
Many of these centers function as language schools, health stores, restaurants, juice bars, and so on. But some groups have branched out and come up with ideas that are outside the box. In Frankfurt, Germany, Presence Culture Lounge invites people from the diverse community to come together and participate in different cultural activities. These include cooking and eating together, watching films and discussing them, participating in literature nights, and organizing art exhibitions. The events encourage individuals of similar interests, but of different religious and cultural backgrounds to engage in conversations and to make connections. Pastor Simret Mahari, the founder of the center, says that in a secular society where the majority of people are skeptical of organized religion, the center is a place where people can feel they belong. Brian Atwell and his wife moved from the United States to Bangkok, Thailand, and opened a rock climbing gym. They had seen a documentary about Bangkok that revealed a need for general health education. The Atwells wanted to help people in this city know that they could take control of their health and avoid depending on costly medicine. They are now making connections with people using a fun and healthy activity. Samyuk Medical Center in Seoul, South Korea, operates a two-story funeral home that also includes private apartments where grieving families stay as they mourn the loss of loved ones. In a country where much importance is given to funerals, the chaplains see the funeral service as an opportunity to share the hope of eternal life with the family members. This message is new to many of them, and families leave the service comforted and touched by the message. The funerals have also made a difference in the lives of the employees. Almost all of them are now baptized members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventists in Suva, Fiji, don't need four walls and a roof to run a center of influence. They're using a park located in the center of the city to provide food to the homeless every week. They also invite the park visitors to join them in Bible studies and in health and singing ministries. Many of the homeless have had their lives transformed as they've come to learn of a God who cares for their needs because of the services provided by the church members. If you are considering taking up the challenge to serve the cities, visit the Mission to the Cities website for ways that you can get involved. Good morning, church family. Make sure my mic's on. Yeah, we're good. All right, it's a privilege to be here to lead in worship with you this morning. And we'd like to wish a happy Sabbath to you all and to welcome you all to church. We invite you to sing with us as we begin our worship portion of the service with Shall We Gather at the River. <laughs> Gather at the river where bright angels see the trout with its crystal tie forever flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather 
gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Soon we'll reach the shining river, soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. All right. Alas and did my Savior bleed, and did my servant die? Would he devote that sacred head for someone such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. The burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He
One more time, a cappella. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sing, I left a crimson stain, he washed it white as Chicago Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's great to have you here this morning. And welcome to those who are watching live. A special welcome to our visitors. If you're visiting with us, thank you for choosing to be here and worshiping with us this morning. We have a few things to go through, a few announcements. And uh, the first one is that today we're going to have the sharing materials on the tables there. We do it once a month. We have a lot of magazines, a lot of books and just take it, it's free, but only take it if you're going to share with someone else. It's not for your own library. I have to <laughs> emphasize that. I know most of you might look at it and say, oh, it's a nice one, I don't have it. Oh, okay, uh, you can buy it somewhere else, all right? <laughs> but these are only for sharing with others. And so please take as many magazines as you want to share at books. Also on the table there in the little one right uh, when you enter, there is these cards we designed for Calgary Central events. We have a, a separate website with our events. Uh, people can just scan with their phone the QR code and go straight to the events, and we advertise all the upcoming events in the fall, all right? So there is a lot of them coming up. So what I thought, you can take one of these, put it in a magazine or in the book you're giving to people, all right? And just give it together or give it separately to your neighbors, to your friends. Uh, it's a great way to advertise. It's very easy. It doesn't take much. So please look through those as well. A church alone ministry is paused until October. So watch for more announcements as we get closer to the fall when we restart that. GYC conference. Uh, anybody knows what GYC stands for? General Youth Conference, yes. Uh, it, this is GYC Canada. Uh, it's for younger, youth and young adults. It's mostly young adults, right, uh, ministry. It's coming to Calgary, actually. This year, their conference is here in Calgary, August 18 to 21. All right, August 18 to 21, GYC conference. Um, if you want to find out more information for the young adults, please visit gyccanada.org. And uh, you'll find out all the information you need to know where they're going to be. I think they're going to be in a hotel somewhere in the, by the airport, I think, in the northeast. But you'll have to look on their website and find out. 
CWA Work B, August 21st at 9, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So if you're available for a few hours to help our school on that date, please uh, put that in your calendar. Make sure you go and help. I just want to do some cleanup before the school starts. Crusaders Club registration, Pathfinders and Adventurers. Parents, <coughs> thank you for those who pre-registered. You guys will receive 50% off of your registration fee, but the actual registration is happening on August 28th from 10.30 to 12 p.m. at the church here. And uh, more information will be on the website and the registration form that you can fill out on the website as well. And so if you need some uniforms and stuff like that, just come here and register on that day and uh, just take, that, uh, care, take care of that on August 28th. I know it's a little bit early this, this year, but because we have so many things happening with Pathfinders Adventure starting the weekend after, so they wanted to register everyone end of August, so in September they start their club activities already. Um, we have a few second readings transferring in a, quite a few members. Kevin Grad, I saw Kevin, are you here today? Kevin, yeah, right there, all right, Kevin. Uh, then we have Andy and Juliana. I see Juliana, just wave to everyone, all right, that's Juliana. Andy's not here with us today. Well, his sister is here, so you're okay, all right, so. Uh, <clears throat> Carl Tory and Lisa Tory, are you guys here today, Carl and Lisa? Uh, we have, I haven't seen them today, but they attend most of the times here. And so uh, all of these are transferring in. So do we have a motion to accept all of these transfers? All in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you very much. It's carried. So uh, pass it on to Andy that now he's a member here. So when he comes back, we'll put him to work. And you as well and everybody else. Kevin is already working hard, I know. And so, um, welcome to our church family. We're glad to have you as part of our family. Um, just one more announcement. I know a lot of people sometimes are asking me. Um, this card here, communicate with us. Uh, this is how we communicate with the pastors. If you need a visit or you want a Bible study, you want a special prayer, mailbox, anything, it's in your pews in front there. Just write it down, your name and your contact. Also, if you want to transfer, some of you have been attending here asking me, how do we transfer our membership here? It's right here. Put all your information, then check the box I would like to transfer membership from, and on the back side, write the church, the name of the church where you are transferring your membership from. And then just give it to one of the pastors or put it in the offering plate, and then one of the pastors will contact you during the week. So just uh, remember, this is how you communicate and let us know um, things you'd like us to help you with. All right, so let me see. I have a lot of things here. Um, do we have, I'm not sure how to say this name, but I'll try. All right, so we have a profession of faith this morning. Uh, Nia Gang Puyot Yot. I hope I said it right. Nia Gang, are you here? I saw her in the morning. But, all right, come, come up front here. And you'll have to tell me how to pronounce your name, all right? <laughs> did, I, did I do a bad job? Yeah, I did, probably. She's not saying anything. <laughs> so she, she, we're accepting her today by profession of faith into our membership. She was baptized in a refugee camp, all right, back in Africa. She was fleeing from Sudan, I think, right? And then she was, and we can't really connect with any church there to have a transfer of membership. So we're happy to accept her by professional faith. So do we have a motion to accept her now? All in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you. God bless you. Now you're a part of our church family. Thank you, and God bless you. God bless you. Well, thank you for being here today as we're worshiping, and I, I hope that you receive a special blessing.
Heavenly Father, this morning we come into your presence and we want to thank you for all your blessings. Thank, thank you for guiding us through another week and bringing us to a new Sabbath day. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be here with us with your Holy Spirit during our service. We pray that everything we do and say today will to uplift everyone who is here and to mostly glorify your name, Lord. Be with us during this service. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We invite you to stand with us as we sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know that saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I Just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me. I invite you to kneel where possible as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of this Sabbath day. Thank you for this holy time, a time for us to set aside the cares of everyday life and come into a closer communion with you. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you bestow upon us, for life, for health, and the freedom to gather to worship you. We pray for those that are not able to worship here today because of illness. Lord, you know the struggles that they are going through, and we ask for your reassurance to each of them that your, your strength is sufficient 
in times of need, and your promises are sure. Lord, be with those who are hurting this morning, the discouraged, those that are despondent, those that have become ensnared by the lure of the world. Bless them in a special way that they know they have a Father in heaven who is quietly calling to them in love and compassion. And dear Lord, we pray for the Voice of Prophecy meetings that will be held here next year. There are many people in this city searching for meaning, understanding, and truth, but they have not found it in their personal pursuits or their churches. Lead us to those that are searching so that we may be a witness to them. Help this church be a reflection of your true character to their surrounding community so they may desire to know more about us. Lord, we pray for Pastor Genna as he breaks the bread of life this morning. May you speak through him the message that you have placed on his heart. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now time to give back to the Lord with our tithe and offerings. First Chronicles 29:14, in describing God's generosity to us, states the following: "But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand." Abraham, a Maasai man, was the owner of a thousand head of cattle and large herds of sheep and goats. Acknowledging that God was the source of his blessings, he decided to be faithful to God. He placed his cattle in large pens and he counted them as they walked through a chute. Abraham dedicated each tenth cow as tithe for God. His friends and acquaintances were amazed. In their culture, people's wealth was measured by the, amount, the number of cattle they had. One doesn't give away their cows. They began to mock him, and many people declared him to be crazy. But the laughter abruptly stopped nine months later when 40 of Abraham's cows gave birth to twins. In addition, many of his goats and sheep birthed triplets. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? That's found in Numbers 23, 19. This week, as we worship with our tithe and our offerings, let us reflect on the truthfulness of these words in our own life. Today's offering is for our local church budget. Will the deacons come forward to collect our tithe and offerings?
It's now time for our children's story, which uh, this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Seth. So I invite all the children up front to hear the story that Pastor Seth has for you. Wow, hello everybody. It is so good to see you all here today. Are you guys excited to be at church today? <gasps> Amen. All right, we've got some really beautiful colors represented here. We got some greens and reds and yellows and whites and blues. Oh, wow, I think every color is rep represented. That's awesome. You guys are so awesome. I could just I could just talk about how amazing you are, you are all day, but I better, I better tell you a children's story, shouldn't I? Okay, so I'm going to use a couple of props for this story. Oh, those are good. All right. Let me not get too ahead of myself, though. I want to tell you guys a story about uh, myself. A few years ago, this was before I was married to Mrs. Bussey, I came home to my parents' place to visit, okay, from school. I was in college, all right? And when I got home from school, I decided to go out on my dad's uh, ATV or quad, all right? So for all intents and purposes, we're going to use this to represent the, the quad. I know it's not quite a quad, but it's the closest thing I had in the house that resembled a quad, okay? So I'm going out on my dad's quad, and, we, and I grew up on, where my parents live right now, is a lot of land, okay, about 90 acres. I mean, out, out here in Alberta, that's really not that much. Um, well, that dude can scream. Um, uh, so 90 acres out in Ontario is a big farm. Out here, it's not that much. But it's a lot of fields. And I'm taking the ATV up in the fields, and I'm having a lot of fun. It's a nice, beautiful day. I'm enjoying the sun. And then I was wanting to get a view because my parents' property is up on a hill and I was wanting to get a view of the hill. But as I was going um, up a hill, I looked far across this field. There's a big field and on the other side was a forest. And I saw a dark shape move. I saw movement. On the other side, it was a dark shape. And I stopped the eight. So I was moving and I see it. I stop and I turn my head and I take a closer look because something has just caught my eye. And do you know what, do you want to know what I saw on the other side of the field? It was a black bear on the other side of the field. And so I'm here with my ATV and I see this, this black bear on the other side of the field. And so I'm like, you know what, I want to get a closer look. Is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. But I thought it was a good idea. I should have known better. But I decided, I turned the ATV this way towards the bear. I started driving closer and closer. To, I wanted to see how close I could get to it. All right? Now, at first, the bear kind of got up on his legs, and he turned around, and he ran this way a little bit. But then he stopped. And I had to put this little guy in the position he was in. He stopped, and he was sitting on his bum like this with his hands down like that, and he was watching me like this, okay, from the top of the hill. You see that? And he was just watching me. Well, that kind of made me feel a little nervous, but I was like, well, I guess he's not as afraid of me as I thought. But you see, I was on an ATV, and I thought I was pretty, pretty um, safe on the ATV. So I got, I was getting closer to it, and I figured, well, if the bear decides to chase me, if the bear decides to chase me, I can just turn it around and I can drive, I can probably drive a lot faster than the, than the bear can run, right? That's what I thought. Anyways, so as I got closer, um, I, I, 
as I was getting closer, I got about halfway into the field. So I'm right in the middle of the field, and the bear is right, at, right on one end. And I'm right now in the middle, okay? And then the bear is looking at me, all right? He's watching me intently, seeing what I'm going to do. All right? And then all of a sudden, I heard a little voice in my head say, Seth, Seth, I think you should turn around. I didn't hear anyone. I didn't see anyone. Seth, I think you should turn around. I heard this in my head. And I was like, well, maybe I should listen to that voice. So I turned the ATV around. And I said, well, I'll have to go bear chasing another day. And I turned around and I went all the way home, okay? I left the bear up in the field, okay? By the way, there was a family of bears living in the woods and I didn't know it at the time. I just saw the, 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 the daddy coming out. So I got back to the house. It took me about a couple minutes to get home. And when I got back to the house, I pulled into the driveway. And as soon as I got back to the house, want to know what happened to the ATV? It ran out of gas. The AT ran, ran, ran out of gas. You know, just about three minutes before, I was in the middle of a field with the bear on the other side. And what, what do you think would have happened if I ran out of gas right here? I would have probably have had to get off the ATV, and I'm now in the middle of the field, and try to run to the other side, and by then, the bear could have come and hopefully not, but could have, right? <laughs> and all of these things were going in my head. But you know what? That story reminds me of another story in the Bible. Because who do you think that little voice was that said, Seth, I think you should turn around. I really believe it was Jesus speaking to me. All right, telling me a little bit of common sense. Maybe you should turn around. All right, and guys, it reminds me of another story in the Bible. How many of you ever heard of the prophet Elijah? Prophet Elijah, okay. The prophet Elijah, he heard God's voice. Now, he thought when he first heard God's voice that God's voice was a big windstorm because there was a big windstorm that kicked up and it was blowing wind and trees and rocks and, cr and breaking rocks. And he said, surely this must be God's voice. But nope, it wasn't. And then he felt an earthquake and it was, everything was shaking and, and, and his feet were, and his teeth were rattling. <laughs> and he said, surely this must be God's voice because it's so big and full of, shaking and noise. Was it God's voice? It wasn't God's voice. And we're like, wow. And next thing you know, the prophet Elijah sees a blazing fire. Fire and heat and noise. And, and, and prophet Elijah was like, this must be God's voice. But was it God's voice? No, it wasn't God's voice. And then after the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, do you want to know what, what Elijah heard? he heard a gentle whisper in his ear. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what the gentle whisper was, per se, but I would imagine it was probably something like this. Elijah, Elijah, I'm with you. You're okay. I'm with you. Because you see, Elijah was going through a difficult time, and he wanted to see a sign from God. But God says, I'm with you, but you've got to stop what you're doing and listen. So guys, sometimes it's difficult to do that in our busy lives, all right? We're costly, busy, but God says stop and listen. Can I, get, can I hear you guys say that? We're going to say stop and listen on the count of three. One, two, three. Stop and listen. Can we do that one more time? One, two, three. Stop and listen. And you see, that's the best way we can hear God's voice. What are some ways we can hear God's voice? How does he speak to us? From the Bible, I don't have, I, is that a Bible right there? I, I meant to bring my Bible, but I didn't, and, um, and so I'm going to steal Kirsten's Bible. Thank you, Kirsten. God speaks to us through his Bible, through the Bible, through his word to us. This is probably the best way we can hear God's voice, but sometimes we've got to turn off all the noises in order to sit down and, and hear God's voice. Thank you so much. What are some other ways we can hear God's voice? How does God speak to us? Yes. He speaks to us in our minds and our hearts. He speaks to us through prayer. I, you have one too? Prayer. Through prayer, absolutely. And one more. Let's take one more. Through other people, God speaks to us. He speaks to us through people. He speaks, speaks to us through nature. But guys, God wants us to stop 
and listen because it's when we stop and listen that God's voice becomes louder to us, okay? So guys, let's just have a prayer and then I'll let you go, okay? Dear Jesus, I want to thank you so much for bringing us to church today. We want to thank you that you are for us and not against us. We want to thank you that you speak to us. Help us to be quiet enough to listen to what you're saying, to take time with our families, with our mommies and daddies and brothers and sisters, to take time each day to listen to your voice. May you speak to our hearts and give us strength and to go in the right direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You can go back to your seats. a baby dedication. So uh, Paola and Carlos, uh, Juan Carlos, can you please bring Mateo to the front and we'll have a baby dedication and if there is more family, family can come up as well. Uh, as they're coming, just wanted to, uh, I forgot to announce something. I knew I'll forget something, all right, because there was a lot of stuff, but uh, Please remember that uh, Let's Move Day that we've been advertising, and you saw the video. We showed it a few times. Go on our church website, and uh, I think on our website with the events that are coming up, and register for that. Remember, it's September 11th. It's coming up fast. August is going to be gone soon, right? <laughs> That's how August works. But uh, just remember that to register, and invite, invite your friends and neighbors to come for that event. Let's Move Day, September 11th. All right. The family is coming up. We're going to be dedicating Mateo today uh, to the Lord. All right. Come up, guys. I have the privilege. This is your husband, right? Okay. Uh, this is the first time I think we're meeting you. Yeah, nice Welcome to our church. It's great to have you here. Okay. And who is that? This is my daughter. Your daughter. All right. Welcome. It's good to have you here as well. All right, so uh, this morning we want to dedicate Mateo to the Lord, and I want to read Proverbs 22, verse 6, where it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. As we are dedicating Mateo to the Lord, I would like to speak to you parents for a few moments about the word train. It's not the train that you take, you know, and go on a fun ride, all right? It's to train up. Um, and uh, in the book Faith Begins at Home by Mark Holman, the author presents the word train as an acronym. Every letter stands for something. So I'm going to give you this acronym very quickly. T stands for time. All right? T stands for time. In our world today, uh, time is one of the most precious commodities, isn't it? Every time I talk to people, I say there's not enough time in the day. All right? But time... Like any relationship, time spent with your children matters a lot, all right? So T stands for time. Spend time with your child. That's the most important thing. That's the biggest gift that you can give to your child, spending time with them. And I'm speaking to myself as well, all right, and to other parents because we never have enough time. R stands for repetition. Uh, I'm talking to you as a parent now, and all the parents here know and you agree that... Um, if you want your child to do something, you have to repeat it to them how many times? Probably a thousand times, right? At least a thousand. And, and you tell the, the, the kid, I think I told you a thousand times and they still didn't do it. So repetition is very important. Repeat to, to Matteo the words of God. Uh, talk to him all the time about God and repeat it to them because they need to hear it often. A stands for acceptance. Um, you as parents must accept your child and unique gifts that God has given to him. Sometimes we know a way that our child needs to go and we want it and we push it that way, but he has his unique personality and character, all right? And let him go that way. You gently guide him with God's guidance as well, but accept him the way he's going to go and try to guide him along the way. I stands for intentionality. You must be intentional about it. It's not just one time here and there. It's an intentional effort every day. Uh, parenting, we would love to take some rest from parenting, right? To have a break, but it's not possible, right? <laughs> We'd like to be like, I want to take a month or two off from parenting, but that doesn't work. 
<laughs> so it must be intentional. It must always be intentional and be involved in the life of your child. Boy, that scared me too. <laughs> All right, and the, la the last one, never ending. N stands for never ending. You never stop being a parent, and that's the same as with intentionality. You never stop being a parent. And so I pray that God gives you the wisdom and gives you the courage and the strength to be a great parent to Matteo and train him in the ways of the Lord. So let me see if I can have him to... Uh, Matteo, you want to come? All right. <laughs> All right, buddy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this blessing and this gift that you have given to the parents, little Mateo. I pray a special blessing in his life. As we dedicate him to you today, I pray that you will guide him and lead him for the rest of his life. I pray that he will be raised in your ways and grow up to, to be your child, Lord. I pray for the parents and grandparents and the extended family and for the church family here as well, Lord. May we be there for the parents to help them and, and uh, whatever they need with, uh, in raising Matteo into your way. So um, once again, bless him and may he grow up to follow you for the rest of his life. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. God yeah, bless you. Let me give you a little gift from our church. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Our scripture reading will be taken from Jeremiah 11, and we'll be starting with verse 1 and going to verse 4. Again, that is Jeremiah 11, verses 1 to 4. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do according to all that I command you, so shall you be my people, and I will be your God. So ends the reading of God's word. Could do a better. 
better job for who am i to serve you i know i don't deserve you and that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on i ask you how many times will you pick me when I keep on letting you down And each time I will fall short of your glory How far will forgiveness abound? And you answered, my child, I love you And as long as you're seeking my face You'll walk in the path of my daily sufficient grace. You are so patient with me, Lord. As I walk with you, What your grace really means The price that I could never pay Was paid at Calvary So instead of trying to repay you I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me i ask you how many times will you pick me up when i keep on letting you down and each time i will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness Abound. And you answered, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. By the way, we're going to preach the sermon together today, all right? It would be interesting. <laughs> um, well, uh, before I invite Kara and Seth to come up, because this is uh, our last Sabbath, me and Beatrice, we're going to be gone on vacation starting Monday, and so we're not going to be here next week when it's his official last Sabbath. So we're doing our um, farewell today. And by the way, there is a potluck lunch for them afterwards, right? right? So everybody stay and, and fellowship and, and, and uh, fellowship with them and visit with them. So um, right, before I invite them, I just wanted to let you know that yesterday we celebrated 15 years of marriage. All right? It seems like yesterday we were standing here and Pastor Barbara was marrying us, but it's 15. Some of you remember that, I think. Some of you were here. And so uh, it's, it's been fun 15 years, right? <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> she always has to do that to me. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, Seth and Kara, Abigail, come up. <clears throat> we just want to say thank you for your ministry here. Uh, it's been great having them with us, right? Amen. And um, I know we'll miss you greatly. Uh, we didn't really have enough time to really get to know you very well of the, because of the pandemic and everything. But 
I know that a lot of lives have been impacted by your ministry. You're a great ministry team together, and with Abigail too. She's such a sweet girl. Hi. <laughs> and um, you know we're gonna miss you guys a lot. Uh, and but I know that God has a plan for you wherever you go. I know that He will use you for His glory. And so we'll we'll continue praying for them. Even though, um, you know, we don't like them a little bit, they're leaving too early, we're still going to pray for them, right? <laughs> now, we'll pray for you guys, and we'll, we, we hope that uh, God is guiding you in your ministry wherever you go. I know you're going to be at catering, you're going to be doing chaplaincy there, well, residency for now, uh, uh, and so then he's going to become a, a full-time chaplain. Maybe you can come here at our hospitals in Calgary later sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have you. My family would cheer that on. I know your family would cheer that on. And, you know, thank you for your music. We really greatly appreciated that, for your words of encouragement, for the way you've connected with the youth and Kara, for your bubbly personality, <laughs> all right? Uh, you know when Kara is there, she's always, you know, outgoing and everything, and she, she loves Jesus, and she shows that in her everyday walk with, with, with the Lord and the way you work with kids and everything. So thank you once again. We have a little gift. It's something inside here. You can open it later. And for you, Andrew's Bible Commentary. All right? It's the newest one commentary that came out. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, bye. You want to give me a hug? All right. Okay, good. God bless you. You have your chance to talk to them at the potluck there. And there are some cards there. We're going to put them in the gym. And, and if you have something for them, there will be a little basket there uh, with, on the table with the cards. And, and so I think this one is making noise again. For some reason, my microphone decided to give me a hard time this morning. But that always happens during the divine service, right? <laughs> during worship service. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, and um, I, I've studied, um, and most of you probably have been studying sometimes in your lifetime, the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. These are not really easy books to read. There's a lot of things going on, uh, but for some reason, these are my favorite books. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit, an overview, a quick overview on the book of Jeremiah, all right? And so... Um, I, I observed a pattern in the book of Jeremiah and also in the book of, uh, you know, Ezekiel and Isaiah especially and Jeremiah. And I entitled that uh, pattern and I entitled my sermon today, Running All the Red Lights. Okay? And I'm going to explain to you in a second what I mean by that. Have you ever ran a red light? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, maybe twice or three times. Uh, you know that it comes at a cost, right? It's a very hefty cost. Some people run the le uh, red lights by accident, or we so say by accident. Well, it was yellow, and I tried to, you know, now they even have cameras and can catch you, like even if you're speeding through those red lights as well. And some people, you know, sometimes do it even on purpose. They don't care, just run a red light. Either way, there are consequences for that. Um, the same is in our, in our spiritual lives. The people of Judah, in the book of Jeremiah, we observe that people of Judah ran a lot of red lights. You know, a red light means what? Stop. Don't do it. Stop. But we see there are many things that God asked the nation of Israel and the uh, people of Judah not to do them, but they did them anyway. They rebelled against God's word and they suffered the consequences of their rebellious actions. Now, we're going to talk about obedience today. Obedience is not a popular word with people today, is it? <laughs> people don't like the word obedience. Well, kids don't like it when you talk to them about obedience, do they? Try and talk to your kids about obedience, to obey parents and obey the, obey the elderly and obey the teachers. No, nah, it doesn't go very well with the kids. But it doesn't go well with adults either. Try talking to someone about obedience. 
The society today says that obedience is an overrated virtue. And unfortunately, this idea that obedience is an overrated virtue is coming into the church as well. If we kept it out there, I would be okay, even though it'd be a, it's a hard to society to live in when people don't want to obey anything anymore in the society. And, and then when it starts coming into the church, the same attitude of disobedience, that's when things become harder and harder. The society today treats obedience as just an option. Ah, it's optional. I don't have to follow this rule or this law. It's optional. I am the above, the law, above the law. But the Bible, in the Bible, obedience is not an option. Or is it? Obedience in the Bible is not optional. Even though a lot of our members today treat obedience as optional, it's not. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. This is our scripture reading, and let's read it again. Thank you, Mario, for reading it for us. But let's go through this one more time. <clears throat> the word that came to Jeremiah, so Jeremiah verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man and woman who does not obey the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do according to all that I commanded you, so shall you be what? My people and I will be your God. That's the essence of the covenant that God made with us, his people, his children. I, you will be my people and I will be your God. But before we can be God's people, God says here a few times, obey, do according to everything I commanded you. You see that constantly being repeated because I think the nation of Israel had a problem with obedience. Don't you think so? Do we have a problem with obedience? Absolutely. That's why God is repeating it. And you'll find it numerous times in the book of Jeremiah. The same thing repeated over and over again. Obey. Do according to the commandments I have given you. And when you do that, when you obey, you will be my people and I will be your God. It is impossible to be God's people without obedience. Do you see that in this? It is impossible to be God's people without obedience. I know we would like to skip that part, the obedience part. We want the fun part, like the kids. We don't want the obedience part because we think it's a burden, it's hard. Now God, see here in, in uh, Jeremiah 11, we see that God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. He gave them the Ten Commandments to follow and the nation said at the Mount Sinai, remember what they responded, Exodus 19? We will do everything, all right? We will keep all of these commandments. God did not force them to respond that way. They did it voluntarily. They said we will keep and do everything. Well, as you look in the history of the nation of Israel, there were isolated moments in their history where they did follow the commandments, but most of the times they failed miserably. Some Christians try to find a wiggle room like children try to, try to find it when it comes to obedience to their parents. You know, children like to push the envelope when it comes to obedience, don't they? And unfortunately, a lot, of par a lot of Christians, adults today, behave the same way. We try to find the wiggle room to see how much we can push the envelope. That, that they might ask the question like, do I really have to obey everything that God said? Maybe there is a commandment that I don't have to do it. Can't I just obey what I like and leave out what I don't like? Are you guys sometimes in that category? 
In so doing, when we ask these questions, when we find, try to push the envelope in our obedience to God, when we're trying to find the wiggle room in our obedience, we behave exactly like children. When Christians are trying to find wiggle room in their obedience to God, they are trying to find out if they can enjoy all the benefits of following God without any of the hustle that comes from playing by God's rules. That's what it happens. They said, I want to enjoy the benefits, but I don't like the obedience part. So I'm not going to play by God's rules. I'm not going to obey his rules, but I still want the benefits. Do we see a lot of members like this today? I don't want that part. I want this fun part, the blessing. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way in our Christian experience. That is what people of Judah did during Jeremiah's time, and this is what many Christians do today. Thomas Akampus says, whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from God's grace. That's a very powerful statement. Whoever tries to withdraw from obedience, oh, I don't want that part, you are actually withdrawing from God's grace. A minister's young son was sitting in the office on the floor, and his father was writing his sermon, and, uh, and uh, the son was watching his father writing the sermon. And uh, the son asked the question of his father, how do you know what to say in a sermon? Wh- why, uh, he, you know, the father said. He said, well, God tells me. Well, the, the son replied, if God tells you what to write, why do you keep crossing things out? If God tells you what to write, why are you keep crossing things out? Now you see, to me, this is exactly what is happening here with the nation of Judah. The people of Judah kept crossing God's word out. They did not want to obey God's word. They didn't like it. They kept running all the red lights. They disobeyed God in everything. Read through the book of Jeremiah and see all the things that they were trying to cross out. In Jeremiah 18, verse 12, says that the nation of Israel walked according to their own plans and everyone obeyed the, the dictates of their evil hearts. They wanted to obey only themselves, never cared obeying God. So how do we understand the book of Jeremiah? One of the keys to understand the rebellious attitude that we find in the book of Jeremiah uh, is found in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 22 and 23. We're not going to read those two chapters, but you can go there and follow with me. I'm just going to give you a, a quick synopsis of those chapters. In 2 Kings, chapter 22 uh, and chapter 23, we see a great revival that happens in, in, uh, in Judah, all right, with the people of Judah. Um, that reformation and revival that was brought by King Josiah, remember that great thing that he did? The Bible says that he found the book of the law because they, he wanted to restore the temple, and they found by accident the book of the law, and that brought a great revival uh, in, in Judah. Now, Even though, it's a very interesting fact here. I always preached about this, and that was a great reformation in in Judah during the time of Josiah. You must remember that Josiah was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached his message during the time of Josiah. Even though... Those were great reforms that Josiah brought. It seems that they failed to permeate the general population. And let me explain what I mean by that. Now, it wasn't for the lack of zeal or effort on Josiah's part. The Bible says in, in chapter 23, verse 5, 2 Kings 23, verse 5, there was no king prior like Josiah in Judah, all right? 
he did a great thing. He, 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 you know, he destroyed all the places of worship to the idols, and he renewed and repaired the temple, and he celebrated a great Passover, and he was reading the book of the law to the whole nation and, and inviting people to reform and revive their lives. It wasn't on the part of J Josiah. It yes, actually was on the part of the people. Even though Josiah did all of these things, and you must understand, Josiah found the book of the law five years before, um, before uh, I mean, uh, before J Jeremiah. J no, Jeremiah was preaching for five years before Josiah, and then for another 13 years, Josiah and Jeremiah kind of were contemporaries, and they were preaching together. So there was a lot of years that Jeremiah and Josiah preached together the message of God. And so when you look at that, all that Josiah did, you would expect that this would be a great revival of the nation of Judah, right? Because one of the greatest events in history. The interesting thing about this, if you read the Bible, it seems that this reformation had little impact on the people. Very little impact. All these reforms were happening during Jeremiah's time, and yet, strangely enough, there is not even one word mentioned about this in the book of Jeremiah. Not even one verse, one word. If this was such a great event and reformative event in the history of people of Judah, you would think that Jeremiah would mention at least a few chapters in his book about this. You don't find any mentioning of that. And that to me was strange. <clears throat> now, if you look at that, I ask myself a question, why doesn't Jeremiah mention that? Before I answer that question, some of you might say, well, Pastor Gena, 2 Kings 23, verse 3, and if you're in 2 Kings 23, if you look at verse 3 there, it provides the proof that this was a great revival for the people. Verse 3 in 2 Kings 23 says this, Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandment. That's King Josiah and his testimonies, and his statutes, with all his heart and all his soul to, reform, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people, what? Took a stand for the covenant. You remember when, uh, when God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, what did the nation do? They took a stand for the covenant. They said, we will do exactly what you're telling us. It's happening here as well. When Josiah speaks to them about the covenant and following the commandments, they took a stand for the covenant. And it might seem that, hey, this was a great revival. But you don't find anything after this. That's the only thing that you find about the nation responding to this reformation of Josiah. Now, there might have been a temporary reformation among the people, a very short-lived reformation, but according to Ellen White, she says in Patriots and Prophets, page 524, that before there could be any permanent, permanent reformation, the people must be led to feel their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God. So all the people said right away was that excitement in that moment. So, oh yes, we will stand for the covenant. But it was a temporary reformation, very short-lived, because they did not do what Ellen White says here, that any permanent reformation, the one that lasts long, has to come with the utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God. So they say, we will obey. They can't do it on their own. It has to be God doing it through them. And that's the problem that we have today as well when we try to obey. We try to do it on our own. And that's why we have all those short-lived revivals. The unfortunate part of this is that as with many other revivals and reformations with the nation of Israel, this one was very short-lived, as I say. They made that commitment then in that moment, the excitement, uh, when they experienced that great revival that then forgot it right away. Don't we experience the same thing today? <laughs> we have revivals, don't we? 
revival meetings. We have weeks of prayers. We have seminars. We invite guest speakers every year to revive and reform our members because they're asleep. We even take a stand sometimes. We're all excited about those. We attend them, take notes, and we even take a stand when the appeal is being made by the preacher. We stand up and, and say, yes, I, I'm dedicating my life to the Lord from now on. But it only lasts sometimes maybe a week or maybe a month, and then that enthusiasm is all gone. Oswald Chambers says this, one step forward in obedience is worth years of study about it. <laughs> and that is our problem. We like to study about obedience. Years and years we're studying about it, but we are very reluctant taking a step forward in obedience. One step. Some of us probably have attended dozens and dozens of revival meetings in our lifetime. And we always just talk about it, and we're excited. We're so excited. We're on the mountaintop high in our spiritual experience, but it doesn't last long. We're just coming down the hill very, very quickly. So why studying for years and not just taking a step in obedience? One step. It's much more valuable than all of the stuff that you learned about obedience and about revivals. So why can't we take this step? What are some things in our lives that doesn't allow us to take the step forward in obedience? Why is it so hard to obey God? Well, I'm going to give you a quick answer from the book of Jeremiah. And I would like to go to those, you know, I entitled the sermon, Running the Red Light. So I'm going to give you three red lights from the book of Jeremiah that the nation of Israel ran and most of, the, most of us repeat the same mistake today and see what we can learn today. The first red light that the nation of Israel ran, and it's a very obvious one, it's, throughout, it's permeated throughout the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, it's idol worship, right? God specifically told the nation of Israel in the commandments not to worship other gods, right? It's a very specific commandment. It's not an option. It's not like, I want to do it where I don't want to do it. And so, but we see the nation of Israel always falling into idolatry. Time and time again, Judah is going away into idolatry. They defied God's command and deliberately worshipped idols. They worshipped other gods. But the problem goes deeper than that. You, know, you see, this wasn't just an occasional idol worship or I will just worship once in a while, actually, it goes deeper than that. The people had a persistent and deep emotional attachment to their idols, and that was the problem. It wasn't just once in a while. This became their lifestyle. I'd like you to open with me in Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 16 to 17. Jeremiah 44, verse 16 to 17. As I said, the people of Judah had this persistent and deep emotional attachment to their gods, to their idols. This is what it says here. As for the word that you have spoken to us, this is what the people respond to, to Jeremiah and responding to God. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. Very clear. Open rebellion. There's no discussion. We are not even going to listen to the Lord. Verse 17, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. What an open rebellious attitude, isn't it? God is saying, don't worship these idols. And they say, we're not even going to listen to God's word. We are going to do what we've always done. It. Our fathers, our king, everybody, we're going to worship the king of he queen of heaven and all our idols and our gods. The problem with the people of Judah and with us today is that they were deeply committed to their idols. It wasn't just an occasional idol worship. It was an emotional attachment. They were deeply committed to them. They worshiped the Lord, but not Him alone. 
We have many idols that we serve today in our lives, don't we? And we are really attached to them. So that when we experience revival, it doesn't really have a long-lasting impact of us because we're still attached to our own idols. That's why we can continue with our revivals in our lives because we are attached to our gods, our idols. We're excited at the moment, but when we go home, we have a lot of idols to worship there, and God just becomes one of the gods. <laughs> we have... Divided, we have divided allegiance. So why does revival have a lasting effect on us? It is because we are too attached to our idols. So I want you to think about it. What are the idols in your life? What are the idols in your life? What takes number one priority in your life above God? That is your idol. This leads me to the second to the second uh, red light that the nation of Israel ran, and it's described in the book of Jeremiah quite a few times. The second red light is uh, it's actually connected to the first one because idol worship always led to child sacrifice. This was the most horrific abomination. Most horrific abomination. They were sacrificing their children to those idols. That's how far they went into their apostasy. Jeremiah 32, verse 35 says this. They built the high places. Jeremiah 32, 35. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Himon to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire of Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind, says God, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. This one of the, was one of the greatest abominations that God detested, and the people of Judah knew about that, and yet they still did it. It's like with the other stuff with idol worship, they just said, no, we're not going to listen to God, we are going to rebel and do it anyway. Now, parents, I want you to understand something very important here. Whenever you serve other gods, whenever you worship your own idols, the result will be that you will sacrifice your children to those gods. If your idol is your work, or your money, technology, social media, whatever is your idol, your life becomes focused on that particular item or that particular aspect in your life, and then, as a result, you neglect your children. Thus, you sacrifice them to that idol. They did it literally in Judah, but today you're doing it spiritually. You're sacrificing your children to idols. This is the most detestable abomination and God detested he said I've never even it never even entered my mind God says to even ask such a thing and they are doing it but we are doing it on the spiritual level as well so parents who are you offering your children to the Bible says that Hannah Hannah offered Samuel to God are you offering your children to God Remember, you can do that only when Christ is the center of your home, when you are not attached to the other idols in your life. That's the only way you can offer your children to the Lord. Otherwise, you'll be offering them to your strange gods that we have, all of us. Let me go to the third point. <clears throat> the third light that uh, Judah ran, and that's the breaking of the Sabbath. I want you to open with me in Jeremiah 17, 21 to 23. All of this are connected together. The main one is idol worship. When something becomes more important in your life, all of this will be connected. You'll, it, everything follows up. Jeremiah 17, 21 to 23. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they did not what? 
obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. Everything God says, right away, Jeremiah says, they didn't obey it. Running all the red lights, breaking every commandment, disobedience. A preacher rode by one Sabbath morning to see a farmer, one of his church members, and he was working, harvesting. And the preacher said, brother, don't you know that the creator of this universe, God made the world in six days and he rested on the seventh day? He wanted to kind of scold his member for not keeping the Sabbath. Yes, said the farmer, I know all about that, but God got finished and I didn't, so that's why I have to do it on the Sabbath. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you finished with your work by the seventh day? Sabbath is not what it used to be anymore for many Adventists. It's still the same commandment. It hasn't changed. It hasn't. How do you keep the Sabbath holy? That is an important question to answer, and I want you to really think about this. More and more of our Seventh-day Adventists today don't keep the Sabbath day as God wants them to keep it. I'll be very honest with you. They don't sanctify the Sabbath day as God did it in the beginning at creation. We are carrying too many burdens on the Sabbath day, and that prevents us from sanctifying the Sabbath day and make it holy. That's why Judas, uh, Jeremiah says, stop carrying all those burdens on the Sabbath day. Leave them on Friday there. Leave them alone. Sabbath it must be sanctified, set apart from every other day of the week. <clears throat> Joseph B. Worthland says, when we love the Lord, obedience ceases to be a burden. Obedience becomes a delight. God says in Isaiah 58 verse 13 that he wants the Sabbath to become what? A delight for us. Not a burden, but a lot of people made it a burden and carried that burden with them. So my question is, what burdens are you carrying on the Sabbath day? Are you still burdened with your work with your things that are going on in your life, and you can't really sanctify the Sabbath day as you should, leave those burdens on Friday and pick them up on Sunday. Sabbath, no caring burdens. That's what the Bible says. Is Sabbath a burden or a delight for you? Think about this. I know this is maybe an old school thing to preach about because we are all so progressive these days. Everything is progressive and everything changes in this life. But Sabbath is constant. It doesn't change, does it? And obedience to the Sabbath commandment does not change. It will stood the test of time and it will stand forever. So Seventh-day Adventists, how do you sanctify the Sabbath day? How do you keep the Sabbath day holy? Please think, think about this. I must say that I see a lot of Seventh-day Adventists that are not keeping the Sabbath holy. It became such a thing, such an easy thing. Oh, it, we can do whatever we want. It says here, stop from your work. Stop from carrying all your burdens. Dedicate this time especially for, for your relationship with God. Think about that. The hypocrisy of the people of Judah was at its peak during Jeremiah's time. I'm going to close in a few minutes. They were okay to be with God, and at the same time, they were okay to live their sinful lives. They had no problem with this whatsoever. Read with me Jeremiah 7, verse 8 to 11. <clears throat> this is an important passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verses 8 to 11. And this comes as a question from Jeremiah, from God through Jeremiah. This is what the question sounds like. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. 
Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after the other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in his house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered. Then you may do all these abominations. So what is happening here? God is asking Judah a question. He's asking them a question in this passage saying, do you think that you can do all of these abominations and then come to the church and put on a form of worship and think that you are delivered, that you are saved, that you are okay with me in your relationship with me? (laughs) They just had a superficial religion. Doesn't it sound familiar to us today? We think that during the week we can run all of our things and worship all of our idols and then come on Sabbath and we sing praises and say, we are delivered, we are saved, amen, and go home and be the same way. That's what they did. They went to the temple and cried out, we're delivered, and then went back home and did all of the other abominations that God is describing in verses 8, 9, and 10. What hypocrisy. Francis Schaeffer writes this. The time of Jeremiah was a period of biblical history which greatly parallels our day. The book of Jeremiah shows how God looks at a culture which knew him and deliberately turned away. Do we live in that time today? Absolutely. But this is not just the character of Jeremiah's day of apostasy. It's our day, he says. And if we are going to help our own generation, our perspective must be that of Jeremiah that that weeping prophet who was weeping and crying over Jerusalem. Yet, in the midst of his tears, he spoke a message of judgment to people who had turned away. Very powerful words. As Jeremiah, we are called to weep, to cry for the world around us, right? That is dying in sin. But we are also called to speak what? The message of judgment and warning to that world that is dying in sin. The world that has turned away from God with our tears, weeping for them, we need to go and speak that message of judgment. Most of us today don't have a problem with the first part, speaking the the words of love and, and have compassion for the world, and that's great. But all of us have a problem with the second part. It's not popular today to speak words of judgment and warning. Because you hate everybody if you do so. People will crucify you for doing that. We don't want to upset anyone, so we are silent, and we hope that someone else will deliver the message of warning and judgment to our world. I can just talk about love and grace, but let Pastor Gena do the rest, all right? If we want to be the people of God, God is calling us to do both, deliver a message of grace and love, but at the same time, a message of warning and judgment. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We must preach that to the people. The society today doesn't want to hear it because they don't want to hear about obedience. But we need to do that. So what should we do? Jeremiah 42, verse 6. Let's conclude with this. Jeremiah 42, verse 6. And makes all of this, what should we do as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists? It says there, whether it is pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Whether it's pleasing or displeasing to someone around us, whether somebody is going to get offended or upset with what we're saying, we must do what? We must obey the word of the Lord. Amen? There is no wiggle room when it comes to obedience. We can't keep running all the red lights like Judah did because we will end up like Judah in judgment. Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 76. One sentence, she says this. In the path of humble obedience is safety and power comfort and hope you want comfort and hope and safety it's only found in humble obedience to the lord that's it 
So that Jeremiah is telling us today, stop running all the red lights. Stop disregarding the word of God. Obedience is the secret of Christian life. So just trust and obey. God bless you. Our closing hymn is exactly that, Trust and Obey, uh, number 590. And please stand with us as we, as we close.
this time. We had a great time last weekend. Some of you were there at the pond at Forget Me Not. We baptized four young people, so I invite them to come to the front here, and we'll accept them into membership. Pastor Seth, you can do the honors. Come on, guys. Come in. Don't be shy. All right? <clears throat> all right. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you four musketeers. Actually, four Moldovan musketeers. <laughs> All right. So, Daniel, we have your certificate there. All right. Yes. Stefan, yours. Who else we have? Roma and Dimitri. All right. All right. Do we have a motion to accept them into membership? All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you very much. It's scared. Now you're officially church members. I know you've been here since you were little kids, but... Uh, now it's all official. We'll pray a special blessing in your life, guys. And uh, I know that uh, with ups and downs, but God will be leading you. So, all right. Thank you. You can come and just say, uh, you know, congratulate them afterwards and shake their hand. They will stay here for a few minutes because we have to go eat, right? So they'll stay here on about 10 minutes. The young people need to eat. So, all right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the Sabbath that you have given us. We thank you for all your blessings. Lord, sometimes we take those blessings for granted and we want them in our lives because that's the fun part of being a Christian and following you. But sometimes we like to leave the, the part of obedience out of our Christian experience. So I pray, Lord, that we will become obedient to you and to your word. That we are not going to pick and choose what we want to obey, but just trust and obey you, Lord, no matter what. So give us that strength to live a life of obedience. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.